Questions about homology are really tricky because they tend to be exercises in circular definition. What do, what do we mean by homo homological organs? Well, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, geneticists and biologists struggled to put together a, a criteria for homology. They talk about a similarity in embryological development, similarity in function, similarity in morphological form. That's reasonable, but a little vague, a little unclear. But what inference do you make from the fact that, say, the fin in a fish is um, structured in a way that's remarkably similar to the hand in a human or in, in a chimpanzee? If the fact that you see some morphological si significance is taken as evidence for common descent, there's not much additional that you need to look for by way of evidence because the issue is definitional. If it's not taken as evidence for common descent, what do you need to complete the inference to common descent? Um, there are plenty of, plenty of examples of homological structures in biology which are obviously not based on, on common descent. For example, take the Australian wolf. Um, which, except for the reproductive system, um, features a wide variety of organ systems that are absolutely homological to the North American timber wolf. But there's no evidence that these homological structures arose because some wolf at some time in the past, or some uh, proto-wolf, um, decided first to migrate to Australia and then to migrate to North America. The evolutionary lines are completely distinct, and yet we see a profound degree of homology. We see this throughout the animal kingdom. Um, the whole issue of homology, commonality of form, is riddled with a, a, a great deal of, of philosophical uncertainty because it's never clear what the evidence is, what the evidence is for, and how one is to avoid completely circular reasoning. What is clear, what is clear is that within family groupings, there are profound similarities in structure. We can say that, but whether they arise because of some constraints in the, in the circumstances of life, or because there's a genuine explanation in terms of a common ancestor, we just don't know in many cases. Uh, the entire mammalian um, group of animals, for example, all of the mammals, have many, many properties in common. Why this should be, we don't know. For example, the, the pentapod nature of uh, all extremities. Um, why is five preferred in the mammalian kingdom and not 7 or 13 or 52? It's, it's an obviously interesting question. Uh, if we say that it is because the mammalian, um, mammalian organisms were derived ultimately from fish, then we have a profound number of problems in that uh, pectoral and pelvic girdles also obey the rule of five. They also obey the rule of five. Uh, where did this constraint come from? It's not entirely clear. The idea that mutations are considered the engines of evolution has only one problem. There's no evidence to support it. Um, as far as we know, and that's a considerable problem, not an overwhelming problem for a scientific theory. There are plenty of scientific theories that lasted a long time with absolutely no evidence. Um, but the idea that, that mutations are the driving force encounters a fatal difficulties. Almost all mutations are deleterious. Almost all of them do the organism absolutely no good. In fact, we have a devilishly hard time finding any mutations that do the organism any good whatsoever. That's one problem. The second problem is that by now, we should be um, attentive enough to look for uh, contrived circumstances in which we can test this idea that mutations, by definition random, by definition random, um, work as the engine of evolution. What we have are a variety of lifelike systems, books, for example, or computer, uh, computer codes. And what we know is that unless we do a lot of careful stage management, arbitrary events in either books or computer codes tend to screw the code of the book up irreparably. Now, there's a, a large question here. If I take a copy of Windows um, 2000 XP and I start introducing random changes, uh, within a very short while, the code will crash. The whole system will be useless. Why exactly is this not happening in living systems? I, I don't want a lot of hand-waving in response. I want a precise quantitative answer. Living systems don't experience catastrophic failure under random mutations because. And if you know, tell me.
I'll take your call day or night. Let's look at the thing this way. What, what does the Darwinian theory say? What is the Darwin, Darwinian anecdote? There are arbitrary changes, meaning the changes are perfectly random. You have no idea when they will occur, and they're not linked to changes that have occurred. And after the changes have occurred, there's a deterministic process which calls out those changes that are valuable and saves those changes uh, which are not, uh, and extrudes those changes which are not. So the process is both one of sheer dumb luck, finding the right changes, and something that is not quite a matter of luck, that is quite deterministic, that is saving the valuable changes. Nonetheless, Darwinian theory suggests that each such episode, luck, change, luck, change, is independent. It has nothing to do with the one that went before. So that in the abstract, it could be modeled by what mathematicians call a random variable. At, a, at first cut, first approximation. When I talk about sheer dumb luck, I mean the amazing fact that these extraordinary, ineffably beautiful structures arise from what is at its heart a stochastic, that is to say, a random process. Now, no one is arguing, say, that if a tiger, a toothless tiger, develops a set of splendid dentures capable of biting its prey, it will improve its chances of survival. That seems obvious. It seems, in fact, so obvious that it's hard to imagine that a scientific theory is needed to explain it. The pigeonhole principle explains it. The pigeonhole principle tells you if you have ten letters and only nine mailboxes, one letter has to go. That seems to be at work in Darwinian theory as an underlying assumption as well. Hardly need a, a hundred years of biology to tell us that. But the essential point is that the structure of the theory is uh, arguably stochastic. Each event, each episode, each bright, bursting episode of change is independent of the one that went before and independent of the one that's going to come after. That's what I meant by sheer dumb luck. A hard time imagining that I myself am the product of sheer dumb luck. I like to see, uh, think of all of evolution groaning its way toward the accomplishment of the noble and lovely thing that is me. But of course, as a critic of Darwinian theory, I, I don't hold with that. Um, of course, I find it difficult to imagine that any contemporary state of affairs is the result of essentially a random process. Um, not difficult for theological, not difficult for religious, not difficult for any reasons of the sacred, but difficult because we have an enormous amount of experience with the underlying kind of processes in mathematics and statistics, and we never see anything like that. I imagine that uh, Juan Luis Borges, the famous writer, was offering an account of the origins of every contemporary novel. And uh, as is wont, um, he, he argued that all novels are really one novel, that is Don Quixote, and that all novels would, were derived from the Quixote by random copying changes in an obscure group of Cistercian French monks. Um, when I wrote that, I wanted to poke fun at Darwinian theory, but the more I thought about it, the more it seemed perfectly reasonable that that should be the account of the origins of the novel. Uh, you began with Don Quixote in the 15th century, 16th century. You had groups of monks who didn't speak any Spanish, didn't speak any French, uh, copying it, as medieval monks, uh, monks copied the Bible. And they introduced copying errors. And sure enough, after a certain amount of time, Don Quixote changed to war and peace. Uh, different language, different notation, different elements, um, but essentially a process of copying errors. Um, if we find that preposterous, and I certainly do, little shiver could, should go up our backs when we think of the analog, an, analogous claim being made in the context of biology.